So if you're observant, that was actually last week's video. My apologies. Now we're going to have an extra one. We'll just have to show at some random time. You won't be expecting it. Uh, you know, just a good reason to come because these don't get broadcast online. So it's a, another good reason to come to church. But speaking of online, if you have a mobile device and if you have Facebook, uh, would you take that mobile device out and just go to Sloan's Lake Church and check in and share the sermon so that those around us uh, can see what Jesus is doing right here in this church. It's a great way way just to reach out to those around you and that are connected to you. So this morning, um, as you saw in there, that, that was the wrong video, but today's message is called The Full-Scale Invasion of Heaven on Earth. I don't know about you, but uh, the, the topic of heaven has always intrigued me. In fact, it probably intrigues me the most because the first person to really sit down and tell me about heaven was a biker named Charlie. I've told you before how at different points in my journey, there were some key things that led to where I am today. Uh, you know, IYC, the International Youth Convention that comes up this summer, was pivotal in me becoming not only a follower of Jesus, but also a pastor. But that's kind of down the road in the story. The reason I even started coming back to church was in junior high, my friend said, Lee, you have got to come to church. We've got someone you need to meet. And so I said, all right. I don't know about this whole church thing, but with the way you're describing this guy, I gotta see this. Charlie would drive his Harley Davidson up to the front door of the church, would park it in front of the door and would stand beside it like the Marlboro Man and just be smoking. And you'd walk by as a kid, you're like, it's time for church, all right, we got this. He'd be wearing his full leather chaps. He'd, he'd have you know uh, the rag on his head. He'd have the chain hanging from him. I mean, it was like, man, we have got the hell's angels teaching us about Jesus today. This is going to be great. And so as a teenager, that was the exciting thing. That was where I wanted to be. And one time, Charlie told us about heaven. I don't remember a lot of the things that he taught us back in those days, but I remember his description of heaven. He said, guys, listen up. Heaven is like this. Jesus is going to give me a solid gold Harley Davidson. And I'm going to ride that solid gold Harley Davidson all across the cosmos. I'm going to see every planet, every beautiful thing that Jesus has ever created. That is what heaven is like for me. And we just sat there and we were like, wow, I had no idea. I don't, you know, we're like, what, 12 at this point? You know, we can't even picture what it's like to drive, let alone ride a Harley Davidson. So, so you know, this is a great image of heaven for us. But as the years went by... I started to realize that there was something a little bit wrong with that picture. It wasn't until much later that I realized Charlie's view of heaven was all about Charlie. There wasn't a whole lot of Jesus involved. It was what he wanted. It was what he was all about. It was about his pleasure. A couple years later, we started to figure out there was some, some things going on that, that maybe that this man who taught us about the hope of heaven didn't quite have the life of Jesus like he had said. One day, my buddy David and I were, were just driving by, and David goes, hey, that's Charlie's house over there. You want to stop by? I was like, I get to go to the biker's house? Oh, man. And we, we come up to the door, we knock, and his wife, who is like the opposite of a biker girl, you know, that you could ever imagine, opens up the house, and she's showing us the doilies on the, the counters and different things. And then finally, Charlie comes back, and he's, hey, guys, how you doing? He said, oh, we just came by to see your house. He goes, this isn't my house. Come with me. And so we went downstairs into his basement. And next to his garage, there was this big, like, warehouse-style room where, you know, this is back in the 1990s. If you ever watched uh, Tool Time, Home Improvement, the first thing you would see when you walk in, you'd go, oh, 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 oh. I mean, it was just a man's paradise. Not, not my kind of man. I'm, I'm not as rugged and manly as him. But you walk in, and there's Harley Davidson parts. There's the smell of grease and oil, and you can see it on the floor. He's got workbenches, and Charlie was proud of that room. But there was a very different reason why Charlie was proud of that room. And it was also the reason that we started to become very alarmed at the same time. You see, on the walls, Charlie had created something of a wallpaper, if you will. I don't know how many hours went into it, but I can't imagine it was under hundreds of hours where he had taken images 
that he clipped out of magazines and placed them meticulously so that there was not even a square centimeter of space. Charlie was pretty proud of those images, and he did all he could to draw our attention to it without us realize, or without uh, you know saying, "Hey, guys, look at this." But the problem was, those images weren't something that drew us to Jesus. Those images were hundreds upon thousands of naked women that he had cut from magazines, pasted all over the wall, where he shared his most and his favorite time. I came to realize years later that maybe Charlie, though he was proclaiming and teaching us about Jesus, maybe he didn't really know Jesus the way he said he did. And as I look back, I realized, man, so much of what he said and did was about him. So much so to the fact that years after that story, he decided his wife wasn't enough for him anymore. And so he went out and got a side hustle, let's just say. But then after the marriage started to break, he decided that the best move would be to move this girl into the house that he's living with his wife because he doesn't have enough money to go somewhere else. So now that room became a place where he lived with his girlfriend in the basement of his wife's house. Charlie's family never did recover. His sons, who now do walk with Jesus in honesty, have, have just shared, man, how much that destroyed their lives. As we've talked about the Apocalypse Survival Guide, the main theme has been, if you live by this, you'll be ready for that. In other words, if you live by the words of Jesus through the Bible, you'll be ready for whatever end your life or life in general has. And as we've walked through this, we keep seeing different aspects about what Jesus has to say of the end of the world. But it's also, if you notice, life right now. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31. We're just going to continue directly after last week's message. The exact same text, we're just walking through piece by piece. And as you're turning there, if you don't know where to go, you can use your table of contents. If you don't have a Bible, you can take the one that's in the pew. That's our gift to you. But it helps to remember where we've been. See, in Matthew chapter 24, where we started our journey, Jesus gets asked about the end of the world. And he starts talking about signs and wonders, but then he starts to take things in a little bit different and unexpected directions. And he starts to talk about wise and unwise virgins. And then last week, we talked about how everything actually belongs to God. How, how, how we use his stuff tells us whether we're a, a one-talent, a two-talent, a five-talent person. And now Jesus picks it up here with a different parable. He says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, with all of the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, and all of the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king, notice how Jesus refers to himself here as the king, will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Pause for just a second right there. If that were all we had to talk about today, that would be, you know, 10 sermons in itself. There would be so much to unpack. One of the reasons I believe in the life groups is because, you know, you get to go from this place. You get to investigate for yourself and say, I don't know about this. I doubt this. I struggle with this. But right here, Jesus is telling us something about the not yet of eternity. But that's not where he stops. Because look, as he keeps on going, he says... In verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then in verse 37, it says, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when? When did we see these things? When did we do these things? And the king will answer, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Notice with me, pause for a second again. 
Notice that the righteous are surprised. This wasn't what they were expecting. This wasn't where things were supposed to go. And in that same way, maybe we're surprised by what Jesus is starting to say as we start to talk about the topic of heaven. But notice also that this connects with everything we've been talking about over the last few weeks. He continues to say, be prepared. And last week, which directly leads into this text, they're not separate. He says to the person who does good with what belongs to God, well done, you have handled little well, so you can be trusted with much. And now he takes that from money and he starts to talk about how we invest in people. I told you last week that it was ironic that that parable is called the parable of the talents. That word means, you know, is equivalent to a sum that's worth 20 years wages in that text. But it's also kind of a word that we can co-op and say, it's not just about the money we spend or how we use God's stuff. It's about how we invest in people as well. So then in verse 41, he says, then he will also say to those who are on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me. And they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, a stranger without clothes, sick or in prison and not help you? Then he will answer them, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do it for me. Perhaps when you saw we were going to talk about heaven, this is not exactly what you were expecting. One of our elders has asked me to, to speak on heaven before, and we'll do something a little bit later on the joy of heaven. But today, as we walk through the Apocalypse Survival Guide, we just got to realize and look at what Jesus is saying right here in front of us. And so today's survival rule, if you're looking in your impact guides, what we do in life echoes in eternity. What we do in life echoes in eternity. You see, whenever the Bible or whenever Jesus talks about heaven, there's kind of two different ways it talks about it. The first one, the one that we're more commonly comfortable with, is what you might call the not yet. The not yet of heaven. That's the idea that, you know, when we die, our eternal soul will go somewhere, right? And here we see an eternal heaven, an eternal hell, two very real places. But notice that's not what the focus is in this text. The not yet of heaven is that joy, that, that hope, that anticipation of eternity. And in some ways, though I'm just going to touch on it briefly, we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we, we sometimes forget about the joy of heaven, don't we? Author Ted Decker in his book, The Slumber of Christianity, has said, this life is powerless to satisfy our dreams of happiness and pleasure. These dreams can only be satisfied in the mind-bending reality that awaits us in the next life. As long as Christians are asleep to this reality, they will search in vain for any lasting fulfillment. And I love this next sentence. Unless we become desperate for the bliss of the next life, we will never enjoy this life. The fact is, nothing in this life can satisfy unless it is fully bathed in an obsession for eternity. Nothing. You know, Charlie's heaven was all about gold motorcycles. It was all this life. It was all things that he wanted for himself. It was a self-obsessed heaven. And yet... Jesus does tell us there is a reality that we're going to enter into when we pass away. And the best description of it, he says, is, is basically look at your shadow on the ground. And the same way that your shadow is different from your body, and yet it's a reflection of that, there's an echo. There's a, there's a reality that our body currently is not what we will be then. That's the not yet of heaven. But this text focuses in more on the now it says, you know, sheep will go in one direction, goats will go in the other, heaven and hell. Did you know if you go to BibleGateway.com and search for the phrase, 
heaven and hell in the same sentence, you won't find it in the Bible. But if you search for the phrase heaven and earth, depending on which translation you're using, there will be between 160 and 200 instances where heaven and earth are together. In their book, Bringing Heaven to Earth, Josh Ross and Jonathan Stormont say this. They say, hell isn't the counterpoint to heaven. Earth is. God made both heaven and earth, and they are both current realities. From Genesis to Revelation, the story is God bringing them back together. Think about it. Whenever you see uh, John the Baptist come onto the scene, what is his message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Yeah, here. What is Jesus' message? It's the same. It's how he starts his ministry. The kingdom of heaven is here. You see, the reality is, Although the not yet of heaven is fantastic and it's something we need to be, as, he, as Ted Decker said, obsessed with, Jesus talked far more about the not yet of heaven. And so our survival tool for this week is bringing heaven to earth. Bringing heaven to earth. <laughs> Never mind the man behind the curtain here. <laughs> Let me just say this, this verse in scripture has always scared me. It's always been something where I've seen this and gone, oh my goodness, I'm gonna get to heaven as a, as a follower of Jesus and I'm gonna see Jesus and he's gonna say, you didn't do enough. Do you see that? The reality is, if you follow the conversation, the context of what he's been talking about throughout the rest of this apocalypse survival guide, you see a context beginning to be built. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven and what it's like. And notice, first he goes to you know, these different uh, things around the world that might happen. He says, no, that's not it. It's not about signs and wonders. Let's talk about being prepared. And he shows us wise and unwise virgins. And then he goes to how we use our money and our things. And now he starts to talk to us about how we interact with people. You see, if you look at it in context, this verse isn't about we're earning your way to heaven. It's not about how we're you know, called to go do things so that we can get merit on our credit card that might get us in to heaven. This isn't the good place, as funny as that show is. It's not about how much you have to your credit or how much you have to your debt. Because what he's talking about is being prepared. And here he's talking about the reality that those who truly follow Jesus are being transformed by him. They're becoming more like him. Their hearts begin to break for what breaks God's heart. See, the reality is oftentimes we think of something as like God is out there in heaven. Let me share something with you that blows my mind, something that I hadn't realized until recently. God isn't in heaven. God created heaven. Heaven is too small to house all there is of God. Heaven is in God. Heaven is in his presence. It's not about us getting a golden Harley and going across the cosmos. That might be part of the picture, but it's not the point. Jesus is the point. And the more we become like him, the more heaven begins to come to earth as well. Think about it. When you become more like Jesus, you don't just fall in love the way you fall in love with a girl or a boy or, you know, a pet. You become like love. You become like the source of all real love. When you become like Jesus, you don't just have peace. You don't just have a sense of wellness. You become a peacemaker. You become more like the one who is peace. You see, Jesus has been telling us throughout these parables, there's a couple different categories, right? There's the wise, there's the unwise. Last week it was the faithful versus the unfaithful. This week it's sheep and goats, which doesn't really make sense to us. But hey, if you were a farmer or the conversation I had before church, if you were at the cowboy church, you might understand that reference a little bit more intimately and closely. But if you look at each of these different moments, Jesus talks about something being different. One from the other, different. 
So the question for us is, how different is the church? How different are we who follow after Jesus? Are we acting and becoming more like love? Or are we trying to earn our way to heaven and focusing on golden motorcycles? In that same book that I quoted from earlier, Ted Decker says this. He says, it's the open secret of the church. We make all kinds of incredible claims based on Holy Scripture, but our lives are often pretty much the same as the unchurched. Christians aren't really so different from non-Christians, certainly not on the scale you would expect considering the promises of love and joy and peace proudly and boldly proclaimed from thousands of pulpits across the land. So our survival tip for this week, if you're following along in your notes, is as Jesus' followers, we are called to bring heaven to earth through what we do daily. We are called to bring heaven to earth through what we do daily. Let me just tell you, this isn't about earning heaven. This is about being the church. Every week when I dismiss you guys, you'll hear me say something like, you didn't just come to church, you are the church. In scripture, the word that we now use for for church kind of got hijacked. Andy Stanley talks about how the original word for that was ecclesia. It meant the ones who were called out. We were called to be different. We were called to make an impact. We were called to be bearers of hope and love and truth. Somewhere along the way around the German Reformation, that word got changed to the German word Kirche, which is meaning a church, a building, an establishment. But the established building is not the church. Just like God cannot be contained within heaven, heaven is in God. The church contains, the building contains the church, but we are the church. It's kind of shaped my reality a little bit over the last few years. Because like last week where we talked about what are we investing in? How are we using God's stuff? When we talk about investing in the church, it kind of goes back to Malachi where Jesus, or I'm sorry, where God says in there, you know, test me in this. If you give to the storehouse, see if I won't bless you. If you won't have an abundance, this is a building, a kirche, a church. It's the storehouse. In a modern term, you might call this the refueling station. The real church, the people of God come to this place to get refueled, to get fed, but not to stop and focus on golden Harleys and and what we want to have and how our life should be but to focus on what Jesus is doing to transform our lives so that we can go back out and take heaven with us and impact our community. Before I close, I wanna give you two quick misconceptions that come up in this verse. They're not in your notes, so if you wanna take notes on the side on your impact guide, there's two misconceptions, and the first one is, my works will save me. My works will save me. See, when I grew up reading this verse, I thought, okay, I've got to work hard to earn heaven. But you see, the difference between Jesus and every religion in the world is that every religion out there says, you have to work to earn to gain heaven. You have to achieve nirvana. You have to do something. Jesus' message is it's already all been done for you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, You are saved by grace through faith. And it is not by yourselves, but it is God's gift, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. We can't earn our way to heaven. If someone's told you, you need to do things so that you earn heaven, they're selling you a false story. Because the gospel is that God has already done on the cross everything that has paid for our debt and sin. But here's the second part that needs to go with that. The second misconception is if I'm saved, I don't have to work, right? The one says, I've got to do everything I can to earn, se- earn heaven. The other says, hey, heaven's a free gift. Jesus has already saved me. Cool. I'm going to sit back and make this all about me. I'm going to ride my gold Harley. I'm going to do whatever I want, Try that in marriage. 
hey, I gave you the ring. Could you shut up about everything else now? I don't have to do anything else, right? Yeah, it doesn't work, right? Try that with your boss. Like, hey, I got the job. Cool, I'm done. Thank you for the paycheck. No, it's not about earning your way to heaven. It's about a reflection and a reaction, a, a redemption that's in your spirit so that once you have seen the grace and the glory of Jesus, you want to bring heaven on earth. Oftentimes we call ourselves as Christians followers of Christ. I've always found that phrase really interesting because if we're following Christ, then maybe the question we have to ask is where is Jesus going? And in this verse, he tells us, he says, I'm with the poor, I'm with the broken, I'm with the naked, I'm with the ones who are in prison, I am with the least of these. We don't go and serve because we're trying to earn heaven. We go because Jesus has radically transformed us so that we can go be a blessing to the nations. You know something I realize? We talk about the poor and broken, and sometimes you can see it. You know, you can go downtown in the, the evening and see many who are poor and broken. But sometimes it's those who are right here in this pew who have the expensive house, the expensive car, and they are dying because they're buried in debt. Sometimes we talk about the prisoners, and we think of those who are out in the, you know, correctional facilities and yes Jesus is saying we should go to them we should be a witness to the people in prison but sometimes what we don't realize is there's someone right next to us in our own life who is imprisoned who has something that's weighing them down something like I described last week where those chains have just shackled their soul bringing heaven on earth means being a witness and being the church wherever you go whether that's at work, whether it's at Starbucks while you're getting a, a, a frappe, latte, tall, grande thing. I don't even know what, I went to Starbucks the other day. I said, give me the biggest one. They said, which size? I said, I don't know. They all mean large. Every single word that you use is just a different word for large. But sometimes you come across someone right there who's got the plastered on smile because they want the paycheck, but they're broken inside. That's what it means to be the church. So today I have a, a challenge that I want to leave with you. And then we're going to open up the altars as we typically do for elders prayer. Elders, I would ask just a little bit different than we normally do. Would our elders go to this side here? And if, if you want to be prayed over by one of the elders, you can go right here and we will pray with you. We will pray for you. But if you just want to pray by yourself, we want to open up this side right here. Your challenge it's not about earning heaven. It's about responding to what Jesus has done. On those next step cards, one of the things we ask is that you, as a, as a person and you as your, your life groups, would go out and serve each semester. Each time we do our life groups, we ask you to go serve. So I'd ask you just to, to check on that, that next steps card if your group is ready to serve. There's some amazing opportunities coming up. Or if you would come up with an opportunity and go serve someone. It's not about coming to church. It's about being the church. It's about being refueled and going back out where Jesus' heart is. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, today we come to this difficult text. And sometimes, Lord, we just, we see this and, and we, we misunderstand what you're saying. We don't take into the fullness of context, God, that this isn't about earning our way to heaven it's about the kind of preparedness you want us to have. Not just being wise, not just being faithful, faithful with our finances, faithful with the way that we interact with others, but also allowing our hearts to break for what breaks your heart. And so Jesus, may it not just go from our head, may this not just be something we heard, but it be something that starts to transform our hearts so much so that we have no choice but to go get our hands and feet dirty. Whether that's talking to someone at work, whether that's talking to someone at Starbucks, whether that's sitting down and talking with our kids about the hope that heaven is not just out there and in eternity, although that is phenomenal and I don't wanna miss how amazing that is, but that you intend for heaven to be right here and that we as your followers, as we walk with you, not to earn heaven, 
but to bring heaven down upon this earth. Jesus, in your prayer, the one that you taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive each of those who are debtors. And deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Elders, would you come up for elder prayer and would you join us in worship?